Hmm. So it is just a lobster with wasp wings. All right, Gary Gygax. That's cool. Oh, hello. I didn't see you there. I suppose you're wondering where the latest campaign diaries is for the Weavers of Destruction setting. Well, I guess now's as good a time as any to do that. So let's get into it. Welcome to the latest installment of Weavers of Destruction. This is part four. And I'm very excited to be talking about this again. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with these videos, basically it's just me talking about my campaign and what's happening. So hopefully you can draw some inspiration from it, you find the story riveting, or you just like listening to me talk about random stuff for between 20 and 60 minutes. Um, if you are one of my players, this is where you should stop watching because we're going to talk about spoilers and all kinds of nonsense. And by nonsense, of course, I mean things that are going to happen in this game that I don't want you to know about. So turn away. For the other 99.9% .9 of people watching this video, let's continue. When last we had one of these videos, I told you about the kind of non-canon-ish Halloween session, I believe, where we had some deck of many things shenanigans. If you didn't watch that, go check it out. But if you don't want to, you're not really going to be out of the loop because that wasn't technically canon to the main storyline. So where we're at right now, the party is with a bunch of orcs that they befriended. They were working with the chief, Garoth. And they were basically going back to the orcs' hometown, which is an old dwarven town called Phragius that uh, the orcs were essentially squatting in. It was a ruin by the point they got there. And um, the party was going to help him go back and reclaim his chiefdom that had been usurped from him. So the party did just that. They made their way to Phragius, which is kind of a down a narrow mountain pass. They made their way there and up through the winding staircase. They kind of just walked right in. Um because they had the chieftain with them, so it wasn't like they were trying to sneak in. He was going back to challenge the guy who usurped him to combat. So at first, the other orcs were kind of apprehensive. He didn't want to let him through, but he explained that he was challenging uh, Gorfell, who was the other orc who usurped him, to the right of... I um, can't remember what I called it now. But there was a specific name for the right that he was going to invoke to challenge this other leader to the right to rule the tribe, essentially. And just for reference, the Orcish Stronghold, I was actually using the module, uh, the Forge of Fury, as kind of the basis for this dungeon. So it was all the same layout as what you would find in that adventure, except this was kind of completely different and off story for what that module actually suggests. And I guess that makes this a good example of when to just steal things from other modules, because I needed an Orcish city or settlement, and this did the trick. So of course all the other orcs at this point are starting to gather around to see what's up and the party and Goroth make their way into this like central massive antechamber. <laughs> or hall, I guess I should say would be the correct word to use here. And he just calls out Gorfell and calls him a coward and tells him to come out and fight. Which of course he does and in his hand he is wielding a red glittering jagged scimitar. <laughs> And essentially what I ruled for what was going to happen in this ritual was that it is the one leader versus the other leader and each of them get to bring along their 10 strongest warriors. The rationale for this was that uh, if any leader was challenged by another powerful orc within the tribe, if that orc was defeated, the challenge was to the death and also all of his head followers would be defeated so there'd be no chance of an uprising happening again. This also gave me an excuse to bring the party into the combat since uh, Goroth had since chosen them to be part of his uh, war party essentially to take on this challenge. So it was the party, Goroth, and I believe uh, four other orcs. And also kind of as an aside, something I forgot to mention here that was just kind of a neat detail was um, before this all happened, the shaman, uh, Grubleek, the orcish shaman, took the bodies of all the fallen from the past battles that they were in, which you could know about and if you watched that part too. Um, they took all of the fallen orcs that were part of their tribe and they burned them in like this huge pyre and it was kind of this funeral role play situation, which was cool. Um, but what they did after that was he gathered up all the ashes and the players were like, why is he doing that? And it was like, it's an orcish ritual thing. They asked him about it and he just said it was part of a ritual. But he gathered up all the ashes and put them into like this big burlap bag. It wasn't until the next session, which was a few days later, um, which in the context of this timeline is right before they went into battle with these other orcs, that they realized what the ashes were for. 
And Goroth emerged from his like war tent, basically almost completely white, just covered in the ashes of the fallen orcs that had died in previous battles. And this was done as an intimidation tactic, and it was also done as kind of a flavor thing. It was just the weird orcish culture, and the players thought that was pretty neat. And then as the ten chosen came forward, the party amongst them, Grubleek, the shaman, basically dipped his finger in like some blood mixture that he had made, and then dipped his finger in the remaining ashes, and then marked each of the players and the other orcs that were part of this ten which was partially thematic, but it also gave them an actual boost. I believe I gave them advantage on the first three saves they had to make for the rest of the day. But anyways, back to the situation at hand. So they were basically getting ready to throw down against this other force of 10. Um, one of the 10 that was in this other force, so you had um, the opposing chief, Gorfell, and then eight other orcs, and two uh, Tanaruks, which are these giant gross orcish creatures, which I briefly mentioned in part two, which they fought back then. But now there were two of them, and the party knew one was kind of a threat already, so they were a little bit scared to fight too, although they had some of their allies with them, so they were confident they could do it, but they definitely started out by picking off a bunch of the weaker orcs, which was the smart thing to do, so at the end it was just the Tanarux and, um, and Gorfell. And at that time, they resorted to one of their tactics that's been working a lot for them uh, throughout the course of this game, which has been the Warlock, um, Oriana, casting Crown of Madness on one of the problematic creatures, which in this case was one of the Tanaruks. They were clever about how they did it too, because they attacked one of the Tanaruks with Crown of Madness, and they purposely didn't shoot arrows or anything at one of the other Tanaruks, so that, um, and then they ordered that Tanaruk to attack the other one. So then they just kind of started having this demon brawl between those two creatures. And as long as she was able to maintain her concentration there, they were kind of occupied fighting each other, essentially. This was not an easy fight. Uh, Gorfell was meant to be kind of a boss to this arc of the campaign. And he was a powerful orcish chieftain. Uh, he also had a couple levels in Warlock, so he had a couple spells he could cast, like Eldritch Blast and stuff. And also, um, the sword he was holding was um, a legendary artifact sword. It was an extremely dangerous object, in fact, it was one of the Dragon's Teeth, which are a collection of seven different swords that exist in my world. Some of you out there may have heard that name before, and if you're trying to remember where it's from, I will tell you. I 100% ripped off that name and concept from Matthew Colville. Uh, in his games, he has the Dragon's Teeth, which are these, uh, I think there's also seven of them, these legendary swords. And I really thought that was a neat idea, so I incorporated that into my game. My swords are different than his. I don't think they're even named the same thing. Um, because I don't know what any of his are named or what they do, aside from Arcturus, the Sword of Stars, which coincidentally is actually one of mine as well. That's right, I did steal that name. Uh, the other six, I'm not sure what his are, so I couldn't have steal stole them if I wanted to, which I probably would have. But, uh, yeah, so there's these seven powerful swords, but... I came up independently on my own of what each of these swords does and what their powers are and that kind of thing. And I've made it very clear in the way I've written each of these items that they are extremely dangerous. These are artifacts that have existed throughout time pretty much since the beginning. There's a huge backstory with where they came from. We might get into that in a future campaign diary. But ultimately, the only thing they need to know is that they're very dangerous. And this guy had one. They essentially, the orcs were kind of just looting through the caverns that were left behind by this dwarvish kingdom and they came across one of the dragon teeth that was embedded in like a pedestal. The orcs kind of came up with their own mythology where it was a cursed weapon they were afraid to touch it because their shamans could detect like dark magic coming from it but this guy Gorfell who was one of these orcs lusting for power took the sword and used it to kill the current chieftain who he became the new chieftain and that was Goroth's father. So this sword in particular is named Iota, and it can allow you to cast certain fire magic. It allows you to cast fireballs and some flame bolts, that kind of stuff, depending on how deeply you're attuned with it, which is a time thing. So the more time you spend with it, the more deeply you attune with it, which gives you access to new powers. And it, of course, is an intelligent item like all of these swords in my world. So this one in particular, they all kind of have a specific trait. This one is very much um, kind of bloodlust centered like it will try to take over the mind of the person wielding it and use them to cause as much mayhem as possible which is exactly what happened and why this guy was able to take over the orcish tribes so this encounter was not an easy one not only were they up against a chieftain who had some warlock levels he was also equipped with an artifact weapon that was sentient and wanted to kill everything they beat him down though and he when he was within like 10 hit points remaining 
he used um, kind of the ultimate power of the sword, which in doing so allowed him to cast a very powerful spell. I can't remember what I called it. It's something I made up though that does a crazy amount of fire damage to a small area but essentially just roasts everything in there for like 20 d6 or something like that. Again, this is a very powerful and dangerous weapon, but that also includes the wielder. So this was him basically under the control of the sword. He stabbed Goroth, the Orcus chieftain who they were with, and used this power. And in using this, not only did it cause a bunch of damage and mayhem, but it also shattered the uh, crystal that was in the hilt of the sword. And, and of course, um, Gorfell died. He was done. That was his last act of kind of like, I'm going to take you down with me. Uh, Goroth was still alive, but unconscious. He was down. And the consequence of that as well was deep, deep within this mountain, there was a massive iron door close to where the sword was. And that door swung open when that crystal was shattered. That was kind of the seal that was keeping that door shut. And inside of that door, imprisoned by the dwarves who were here centuries ago, was a massive red dragon. So this was a laughably unfair fight against the PCs. This dragon would have probably annihilated them if they tried to kill it. And for a lot of these players, this was their first time actually encountering a dragon, because many of these players are new to Dungeons & Dragons. I mean, dragons is in the name, so I wanted to give them a good, like, dragon experience without putting them in a situation where they're all going to get killed. So what happened, I described the kind of the mountain shaking, and uh, a couple of the players did speak Draconic, and I explained how from the depths of the caverns that were kind of in a separate chamber altogether, they could hear in Draconic this bellowing voice explaining that Elamon, the mountain's king, had returned to take back what was rightfully his. So this dragon clawed his way up, eventually getting to that antechamber, and this turned into a skill challenge. Basically, they had to escape the uh, orcish city before the dragon could kill them essentially. But I figured it was boring to do that as straight up combat, move, move, move. Okay, it's dragon turn, he moves, he attacks this person, move, 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 move. So I did it as a skill challenge. If you're not familiar with what a skill challenge is, I have a video about that now, so definitely go check it out. But uh, basically what it was is they had uh, to make five successes before they had two failures. This was gonna be tough for them to escape. And I didn't outright give them a choice by saying you can do this or this, but in the situation that uh, Garroth was in, he was impaled by the scimitar and just kind of bleeding out. So they had the choice, and they had this choice, I didn't pose this to them, but they knew that uh, they could just leave him, or they could try to save him. But if they saved him, it would mean staying in this room for an extra round. And they asked me what the consequences of that being. I said, well, you can save him. You can get him onto the back of one of the direwolves that's with you, and you can heal him up. But if you do that, it's going to count as a failure because you're not actively running out of this massive city. And they said, okay, we're going to do that because they thought it was worth risking life and limb because it meant saving this NPC who they had grown attached to and really liked. And I was like, okay, you're really rolling the dice, literally. But uh, yeah, I'm not going to stop you from doing that if that's what you'd like to do. Absolutely. And that's what they did. And... Um, it was very close. I believe every member of the party used their inspiration during this skill challenge, um, but they made it out. They made it out successfully. They didn't fail once. They had five successes in a row, and uh, they got through the front door, and I described kind of the entrance to the cavern, like, collapsing behind them as the dragon was just, like, melting the stone and that was, like, feet away from them with his fire breath. So they brought Garroth out, and he was recognized as the chieftain by his people. Uh, none of the party members died, and of course, Garroth did the classic, like, you shouldn't have saved me, but thank you. And it was good. It was a good moment. It was a really fun session. It was very high tension, but it was a good climax to this kind of adventure that they had been on. They also managed to bring the sword with them, and this is where things got interesting because this is where we're starting to get into the main plot of this campaign. The sword, I... I think it was Karen who picked it up first and she didn't want to touch it with her bare hands so she kind of I believe they wrapped a blanket around the hilt and grabbed it because they thought it looked dangerous and it's part of Karen's backstory where her father was like a great treasure hunter and told her tales of the dragon's teeth because he was always trying to find one so she drawing on that and kind of 
putting two and two together, assumes she's like, I think this is one of them. I think this is one of the dragon's teeth. And in conversation between what she knew and what Grubleek knew, they were able to put it together that this was, in fact, uh, one of the dragon's teeth. So she knew not to touch it, which was smart because it is a sentient weapon that would try to take you over. I didn't tell them that, but just from context clues, they figured they didn't want to touch this thing with their bare hands. So she wrapped a blanket around her hand and went to pick it up and tried to put it in, so, uh, a quiver. And this is what's interesting, she got a quiver of Elowana in the last session during the Deck of Many Things fiasco. That was one of the magical items that was handed out, which is a neat item. If you don't know what that is, it's essentially like a bag of holding. It's an extra dimensional space, except it's a quiver, so it can hold like a bunch of arrows and stuff. It's a, it's a handy tool. And they were like, okay, we're gonna take the sword and we're gonna put it in the quiver of Elowana. So she went to do that, and I described how the sword kind of like jittered, and she was like she was forcing it in, and then it just got spat out and flew like 10 feet in the opposite direction, and she just kind of heard some ominous laughter echoing in her head as if the sword was saying, you think that you can simply put me in an extra dimensional space if I don't choose to go into one? Like, it was a creepy moment for sure, but they definitely drove home the fact that this is not something you want to mess around with lightly. The other part of this was that um, Grubleek, in conjunction with Karen, putting together these legends and what Grubleek knew about the sword and what his people had kind of passed down from generations, was that the sword was used as a tool because it was very powerful and magic to seal those doors and to seal the dragon inside of the mountain. And once that crystal was broken, the seal was broken, the dragon was set free. However, unless the sword is completely destroyed, the dragon isn't totally set free for what the actual number is, is 30 days. They didn't know that it was 30 days, but they knew the dragon was going to be able to leave the mountain completely in an amount of time. And I didn't tell them they had to go back in. They could have just left that dragon be and said, cool, we're going to take the sword and we're going to get out of here. Uh, then they would have to deal with a red dragon being free in the world, which is a scary thing. And who knows what might have happened, but... I didn't tell them any of that, of course. They made the decision on their own. They were like, no, we set it free, kind of, by engaging in this battle. We need to fix this, and we need to get the orcs back their home as well. So they found a secondary way into the mountain through a cavern system that was on the opposite side. And uh, they decided they were going to try to take the sword back in, put it back in its rightful place, thus sealing the dragon in the mountain once again. So there was a lot of strategizing here, and it was kind of cool because they went back in and they were retreading the ground they had seen already. They had seen this place as like an orcish city, but they went back in through this kind of secret entrance that one of the orcs was able to tell them about. And they saw this same orcish city, but completely abandoned. There was no one around. Uh, there was The floor was just coated with ash of what once was a group of many orcs. So the stone tiles and everything were kind of like melted and fused further to the ground and it was just a very like atmospheric kind of creepy thing like almost post-apocalyptic they were walking through this city that was now just dead uh they encountered a couple fire elementals but they were able to uh hide from them so they didn't get spotted by any of that and they made their way deeper into the mountain and of course they went through some of these ancient dwarven tunnels um they fought a few just like natural creatures that were down there, like Sturges and stuff, and they made their way into um, this ancient dwarven ruin that was much deeper in the mountain that was clearly um, part of their city before it kind of fell into disrepair like a millennium ago. So they made their way through that, it was kind of a mini dungeon which was fun, uh, a few traps, that kind of thing, nothing crazy. Uh, they fought a lot of half dragons that were the minions of Elimund the Mountain's King, and eventually they made their way down to what was clearly the dragon's home, for lack of a better term. Basically what was happening is they made their way down into a natural like river system and they went across a few bridges that were down there and there was a giant stone door in front of them and on that same wall about five stories up there was a huge hole in the wall which was where the dragon had kind of burst through. And they could hear the dragon breathing, like, heavily. So they knew it was close by. I wasn't trying to surprise them with this. They knew what they were walking into. The room that the dragon was in, because they kind of, they had their uh, rogue, um, Mona, climb up to that top ledge and she was looking down, kind of surveying the area. It was a huge circular room, and in the center of it was a massive pillar. 
and from the information they had, they thought the pedestal on the giant iron door was on the opposite side of that pillar. So they just had to get it in there. And of course they could hear that there was a dragon in that room, but they couldn't see him. So what they decided to do was they took Mona, the uh, assassin, and Tim, who is the uh, druid that thinks he's a cleric. And um, the reason they took Tim was because Tim has the highest wisdom score in the party. And they thought if he has to grab the sword and put it into something and touch it with his bare hands for any reason, he's going to be the one to do it because he's going to be the most likely to make his wisdom save. And I thought that was pretty smart. So those two were going to try to sneak in and do this while the rest of the party was going to act as a distraction. Because they came to the conclusion, which was correct, that they didn't need to fight the dragon. They just needed to seal it away and then get out. Because there was no way they were going to beat this dragon in one-on-one -on -one combat, which is correct. Because this dragon is like, it was, uh, I was using the stats for an adult red dragon, which is like a CR 12 or 13 monster, I think. And the party's like <laughs> level 4 at this point. But it wasn't meant to be a combat encounter. They knew it was suicide to try to kill this dragon. And uh, that just made it all that more imposing. It's one of the only times I think I've ever actually seen a D&D &D party have an interaction with a dragon where they were like, that is terrifying. They were treating it with kind of the respect that you would treat a dragon in real life because it can annihilate you if you give it the chance. Long story short, uh, the assassin Mona and the cleric druid Tim were going to Rappel down the inside and try to sneak over. Then the party was going to open the doors. And then the dragon was going to be lured to them, hopefully. And then they could sneak around to the uh, pedestal, which they thought was on the other side of this big pillar. So, the assassin Mona and Tim go up. They go to parallel down. Mona gets down just fine. Tim rolls a nat 1 to uh, climb down in his athletics check. And then he uses his inspiration and rolls another nat 1. And then falls, and I was like, okay, well, Mona, I was trying to be lenient here, and I was like, Mona, you can uh, use an acrobatics check to try to catch him, maybe. She rolls, and rolls a nat one. And it was just like, oh, no. So, they're both on the ground, on the opposite side of this door where the party is, when the dragon, of course, wakes up and hears them. And they just, from this big pillar that's in the middle of the room, from either side, they see two massive, like, burned and charred wings. And the dragon starts crawling around the pillar and, um, saying something in Draconic, basically just saying, like, what do I smell? Like, I know there are adventures here. Would-be heroes come to seal me away? That kind of stuff. And, um, so Mona grabs him and drags him. So the dragon is on this pillar, facing out the gap, looking down at the doorway. And Mona and Tim are directly underneath him. And the party at this point realizes things are going bad and they open the door to try to distract him. And then we roll initiative. Um, so Tim and Mona roll stealth. Mona rolls stealth to try and hide. And she just takes the sword at this point. She's making an elective decision. She's like, all right, Tim is useless. He's falling all over himself. She takes the sword and goes around the opposite way that the dragon came, looking for the pedestal. She ends her turn over there, and she sees the pedestal that the sword needs to go in. It is, in fact, there. And Tim is like, oh, man, this is terrifying. And uh, the player who plays Tim, Paul's, again, very good at getting into character. So he's, like, freaking out. He's like, oh, my God, Pelor, Pelor, save me. Like, this is crazy. So he rolls stealth, because it's the only thing he can do. Because the dragon's close enough where if he uh, tries to run away, he's not going to get far enough that it can't fire breath him. So he just tries to roll stealth. Rolls horribly. So I basically described this as Tim just laying at the bottom of this pillar, tied up in rope that he fell down in, like just screaming, crying. Like he has no idea what's going on. Um, and the rest of the party is like, oh boy, here we go. And half of them move off to the side of this doorway, not going in the room to try to get out of the way. The other half didn't get to do anything because the dragon of where it was in the initiative order it uses its fire breath. And fortunately, amongst the people who got caught in the fire breath were Oriana, who is a tiefling, and Atlin, her servant, who is also a tiefling, which have fire resistance. And they both made their save, so they only took a quarter damage. Um, everyone else made their save as well, I think, which resulted in only half damage, which still did like 30 damage or something like that to most people. And they were like, wow, if that had hit us full force, we all would have died. That's terrifying, which it is because it's a dragon. And that is what was intended. Like I was ready. I didn't want them to die. And if they had have failed their saves, they wouldn't have straight up died. They would have just got down. Tim hopefully would have healed them. But, um, 
it was a risk I was willing to take because they were going to fight a dragon and I wasn't going to nerf that for them because that's going to take away from their experience of fighting a dragon. Fighting a dragon should be hard. It should be deadly and there should be a good chance that you're not coming back from it. So um, that's just the kind of game I run and they knew that going in and they decided to do the right thing anyways. And fortunately, they all came out unscathed when it did its fire breath. So Mona, on her turn, because she's first, because she's an assassin, she had like a 25 on initiative, plants the sword on the pedestal. She doesn't care. She goes, I'm going to probably have to make a save. And of course, I made her make a wisdom save, and she rolled very, very high, which was good. She plants the sword on the pedestal and uh, kind of like burns her hands and stuff. And all these like red tendrils erupt out of the hilt of the sword and start grabbing onto the dragon, pulling him into this massive iron door that is now in front of Mona. So she's like, cool, that's good enough for me, and starts running out, grabs, uh, all, I think she tried to grab Tim, but she couldn't quite do it on the way out. She was like, screw it, and just kept going. And at this point, the dragon is just like clawing at everyone who's nearby that it can, because it knows it's being pulled back in. It's trying to resist it. The, dra I, the dragon was getting saved to not be pulled back in, and it was failing horribly. So long story short, what ended up happening here is the tendrils are pulling the dragon into the pillar and he's like breaking the pillar as he goes through. Uh, every time he fails a save, he goes another 10 feet into this pillar. There was a cool little moment where Feldon the Paladin like ran in to get uh, Tim who was on the ground and he like grabbed him and dragged him back out. And he was like, come on, Tim, like get your shit together. We're going. And they dragged him out and Tim was being played perfectly by Paul. And it was just a good moment. They, uh, he, I think, did lose consciousness because the dragon clawed him at one point, and they resuscitated him, used a healing word on him, I think. And uh, he came back, and it was good. So he didn't die. And then the rest of the party is like, "Oh, we did it! The dragon's being pulled away. We're out of fire breath range, so they're just watching it be dragged back in." And then its last words is just like, "I will return, of course." And he gets pulled through the pillar. And the whole pillar collapses and he gets pulled into the door and the door just slams shut. And then it's silent for a minute. And then the ceiling above starts to crumble and collapse. And pools of lava start dripping down and the party's like, oh no, what's going on? And this, again, turned into another skill challenge where they had to try to get out of this deep dwarven uh, cave system while the lava was slowly building up and collapsing behind them and everything. And that was cool. So, and uh, they succeeded on that as well. Everybody made it out fine. Uh, no one died. They came pretty close many, many times, but no one actually died, which was good. Uh, so then they came out and they were like, we don't have to worry about that sword. It's buried underneath 50 feet of lava. Um, and they told Grubleek, like, don't tell anyone it's there. Just let it fade away from your people's mythology. And uh, yeah, so long story short, at the end of the day, they made allies with the orcs. Um, so they have a place to go now if they're ever in that neck of the desert again. And uh, that kind of wrapped up this little arc of the campaign. So um, a little, I guess a callback to something that happened in like the first or second session. Uh, Mona had a bounty on the paladin who became a supplicant of the Galthias tree. So she wanted to collect that bounty, and that was the only real clear objective that the party had at this point. So they said their goodbyes at the orcs. They stayed one last night and kind of celebrated with them. And the orcs, they did this whole ritual where the orcs, like, brought them in as one of their own. They're like, you're part of the tribe now. Like, you always have a place with us. And if any of our frost fire wolves see you, or any of our frost fire uh, orcs, sorry, see you out in the wilderness, like, they'll know your friend kind of thing. So that was cool. And then... They left to travel back across the desert to go to the dwarven city of Barum, uh, the ringed city of Barum, and uh, so Mona could collect her her fee owed to her for her assassination of that paladin who was already dead, but we'll get to that in the future. And I think that's probably where we're going to end this one for today. That seems like a good enough place to end this campaign diary. Uh, so when we come back in another week or so, hopefully there won't be as big of a gap as last time, um, we'll get a little bit more into what happens when the party travels on the road to Barum. Uh, so hopefully you enjoyed listening to me talk about my game for a while. I apologize if I tend to ramble about things, but that's exactly what this series is, is me rambling about my game. So, um, yeah, hopefully you enjoyed that. Uh, if you're new to the channel and this is the first of my videos you're ever seeing, I definitely recommend checking out uh, Monster of the Week, a show where I talk about weird, crazy monsters. And if you're a DM, we've got DM tips. And if you're a player, we've got player tips. 
Uh, so something for the whole family. Definitely check that stuff out. If you're not already subscribed, the button is down there. You know what I'm going to say. And as always, I just want to say a big thank you to all of you guys for watching this and supporting me in what I do. It really means the world to me. So thanks a lot, guys. And I guess I'll see you in the next video. Till then.